News Talks of B, it is 27 to 11. Now for his second appearance on this radio station today over the release of his book, Incredible Luck, Don Brash, good morning. Good morning, Leighton. Now earlier this morning you, um, you covered off uh, personal aspects of your life. Mm-hmm. I wanted to concentrate on, um, on some, uh, some other matters. I'm very pleased about that. The, the, business, the business end of, of life. Um, as the Governor of, of the Reserve Bank, and that's w- what you were doing when, mm-hmm. when I first met you, mm-hmm. And um, I remember having some serious discussions with you over, over various things, uh, particularly interest rates, uh, on and off the microphone, if you like. I want you to, I want, I mean, I could sit here and talk about it, but I want you to tell us the, it, about the establishment of the Reserve Bank mm-hmm. and what its role is. Mm-hmm. Well, the establishment goes back to the 1930s. Uh, it's entirely government owned and I say that because many people have the idea it's run by the private banks it's not it's entirely government owned Uh, for most of its history it was controlled directly by the government in other words it raised interest rates or closed and reduced interest rates on the whim of the the Minister of Finance Uh, the fourth Labour government changed that structure radically so that now the government contracts with the governor on an inflation rate which the governor has to deliver and I think it's a very good framework is it working as well as was hoped and as well as you could expect? Uh, yes, I, ha- I think it, it is. I think it's working extremely well. What people don't fully understand is the relationship between the Reserve Bank and the exchange rate. And you get a huge number of people, including the Labour Party, of course, saying the Reserve Bank Act should be changed so that the, re- the exchange rate could be reduced. Mm. Now, they unfortunately confuse the nominal exchange rate, which is the one we all talk about, mm. from the inflation-adjusted exchange rate. I mean, for most of our post-war history, the New Zealand dollar was buying more than a dollar US. Now it's buying uh, 80-something cents, and exporters are screaming. Why? Because our inflation rate has been higher than that in the United States over most of the post-war period. You can't get the real exchange rate down for the benefit of exporters by tinkering with interest rates. Okay. Why is our inflation rate what it is then? Why has it, why has it changed? Why is it as high as it is? Uh, well, the inflation rate uh, right now isn't very high. You, the inflation rate, you mean or the change rate? No, I'm, no, I'm, no I mean the inflation rate. Okay. And, and let, me, let me qualify that statement. Okay. There is a belief, and I have some sympathy with it, that the exchange rate is, sorry, the, uh, the inflation rate is not as, not a, the way it's expressed is not what the true inflation rate is and that things are actually going up faster than because... There are too many things that aren't included in the inflation in calculus. Yeah, CPI, yeah. the Consumer Price Index. Um, that is certainly a perception, and over years we've had all kinds of groups saying it doesn't reflect our cost of living. The elderly, for example, say our cost of living is going up faster than indicated by the Consumer Price Index. Uh, there may be something in that, but I have to say the CPI calculated by the government statistician is not calculated by the Reserve Bank, is not calculated by politicians. It's done by an objective process, and uh, you can say it doesn't quite reflect my cost of living, but it does, I think, pretty accurately reflect the average cost of living. And you can only have one inflation rate well, as you such. Can, you can only have one, C, one CPI. That's correct. Officially, yeah. that is. Yeah. Now, the, let me turn attention then to the Federal Reserve in America. Mm, mm. Just, just briefly, mm. that is a privately owned bank. Uh, yes and no. Uh, I, I, as an economist, that's all I know. <coughs> Excuse me. There are 12 regional Federal Reserve banks which are owned by the banks. That's quite right. The Federal Reserve Board of Governors in Washington is a federal statute, is set up by federal statute. The Monetary Policy Committee is dominated by government appointed governors, of whom, of course, Janet Yellen is the chairman. So there's no sense in which the private banks control monetary policy in the United States, despite many rumours to the contrary. Then explain to us how the, how the Fed Reserves makes its decisions and whether or not it makes money. Uh, well, the Federal Reserve makes its monetary policy decisions through a federal open market committee with 12 members. Seven of those members are appointed by the president, vetoed by the, the Senate or, or otherwise. Seven of the 12 appointed by the, the president. The other five are rotating members, presidents of the regional Federal Reserve Banks, the 12 of them. Mm. So it's basically controlled by a political process, not a private uh, profit-driven process. But it still makes money. Indeed it does. Uh, And 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 how does it make money? uh, Well, it makes money, I guess, in much the same way that central banks the world over make money. 
uh, let's take the Reserve Bank of New Zealand as an example because I know it well. The Reserve Bank issues bits of paper, or in our case, bits of plastic, as banknotes. They, they take value for selling those bits of plastic to the public. In our case, we have bank uh, notes on issue roughly, roughly, say, $3 billion. That $3 billion is invested in government bonds, earns interest at, let's say, 5%. So the, that generates $150 million of interest income for the Reserve Bank annually. The cost of printing banknotes and the cost of running the Reserve Bank is much, much less than that. So that, that is uh, where the Reserve Bank not only makes money, but, but makes big money. And so what happens to that? It goes directly to the Treasury. And that was, again, part of the reform of the 89 period. It, once upon a time, uh, was spent at the Reserve Bank's discretion and what the Reserve Bank had left over went to the Treasury. Okay, so just to, just to, to finalise this, the Reserve Bank makes money from its business Yes. and that gives, and gives that, the profits to that to, to Treasury. Correct. All right, so in fact it's a form of taxation because it's making, it's making money out of money, out of printing money and doing, doing that aspect of the business and so it's costing you and me as, as taxpayers, it's costing money. Well, effectively... A banknote is a non-interest bearing IOU. When you hold a hundred dollar banknote, if you do, we don't often hold these that these days, you've effectively lent the Reserve Bank a hundred bucks of value, which they invest in government bonds. And from from the, the reality is the higher the inflation rate, the higher the tax on you because you're lending the Reserve Bank money at no interest. I don't want to get bogged down in this because there's some other things that we must cover after the break. News talks about seventeen to eleven. Uh, Don Brash's book, Incredible Luck. I just want to. St- I've got one more question for you with regard to the to the international banking scenario, because the conspiracy theorists love this, and they milk it for all its all its worth. Uh, they will they will try and well they do they constantly try and tell me for instance that the governor of the Reserve Bank in New Zealand gets his instructions from elsewhere. <laughs> I want you to tell me where where you got your instructions from outside of this country, over how you would do business? <laughs> it simply did not happen. I got my instructions clearly from the Minister of Finance, who signed a contract with me, which was a public contract. Everyone can read it. Uh, first of all, of course, it was, was Roger Douglas. Uh, I'm sorry. Actually, first contract formally was signed with David Cagle, subsequently Ruth Richardson, <coughs> and the third contract I signed with Winston Peters. And nobody from the Fed Reserve or from any conspiracy organisation ever instructed... When you went off to meetings internationally, you were never told what to do, (laughs) never given advice on what you should do. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Categorical assurance. But, Don, how can we believe you? Well, that's a good question. I mean, all I can say is categorical assurance. I did not get any instructions whatsoever from outside New Zealand. And so you always made the decisions yourself in consultation with, I'm presuming... Um, assistant governors well, well, or whatever. Well, I had a small monetary policy committee. They didn't actually formally make the decisions, but clearly I consulted them very carefully. What is the future of um, of printed currencies? Uh, well, I think it depends very much. Paper currencies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it depends very much on whether central banks can keep their value more or less stable. And I think actually most central banks have done a reasonable job on that in recent times. What of the uh, what of all the printing that the uh, the, the, the Fed, Fed Reserve is the, doing and the and European, European Central Bank and yeah. the Bank of Japan, yeah. the Bank of England, etc., yeah. creating uh, money from nothing? Yes, that's correct. Uh, and what they're doing is saying they're doing that to avoid deflation, prices actually falling. Now I think that's a sensible thing to do. The risk is that when animal spirits finally sort of catch up with us, uh, that huge amount of money might might lead to inflation. Now the central banks say they will pull the money out of the system if that happens. New Zealand hasn't had to do that. How would they do that? Uh, exactly the reverse of the process of what they've been doing. Instead of buying government bonds, they would sell government bonds. What's the future for New Zealand's currency, do you believe? Well, I think the New Zealand dollar is overvalued. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we're still running a balance of payments deficit, which means we're spending more overseas than we're earning overseas. Uh, that's a suggestion that the currency is too high. Most people think <coughs> it is too high. So it should come down, but for some reason, which we can't go into at length here, it's still holding up. How much overvalued do you think it is? Well, 10 or 20%. 10, 20% is a lot. It is a lot. But I mean, uh, at... Let's say it plummeted 20% yep. in, the, in the next month. Mm-hmm. What would be the result of that on the living standard of New Zealanders? Uh, it would go down, without question. 
uh, everything which we import and everything which can be exported would go up in New Zealand dollar price. The most obvious thing being petrol would go up quite sharply in price. So I'm not suggesting that would be a comfortable thing to happen, but the reality is despite the best export prices in a generation, we're still spending more overseas than we're earning. All right. You've been involved, you have been involved um, in in export organisations. Mm -hmm. You've been involved in a lot of overseas business. Does New Zealand have a healthy future on the international stage? Or are we, or I'll just give you an, uh, an alternative, or are we going through a period at the moment where we're peaking because of milk prices, et, et, et cetera, but in, milk prices in particular, and all of that is likely to change? It's not meant to be a negative mm. question. It's giving you an mm. option. I want to know what you think. Yeah. I mean, one of the things in my book I say is that we haven't, in fact, improved our real trend rate of growth in the last few years. We're still growing, according to the Reserve Bank, between 2 and 2.5%. Two and I'm sorry, that's their potential growth rate they think, between 2 and 2.5%. Two and we will never catch Australia at that rate of growth. So we're still a slow-growth economy, very heavily dependent on foreign savings, or as I say, spending more overseas than we're earning. So in that sense, we're still vulnerable. It is uh, 13 to 11. More with Don Brash after the break. New Talks of it is 10 to 11. Don Brash's book released today called Incredible Luck... He's been everywhere today, to be blunt, twice on this radio station. Um, uh, is Janet Yellen any good? Uh, too early to say that. I mean, she's been Deputy Chairman of the Fed for a time. I have no reason to believe she's not very competent. Was the previous, whose name escapes but me for some reason. Yeah, was he any good? I think he's pretty good, yeah. I mean, if, if, you, if you accept that the job of the Fed is to keep inflation low and stable, he did. All right. So some folks are thinking, why is he talking so much about the Fed? How much influence does what they do have on our economy even today? Well, it does through the exchange rate. If US interest rates are very low and others are somewhat higher, then almost by definition our exchange rate tends to rise a bit. It's not the only factor driving it, but it's one of the factors, and okay. therefore that has an effect on the New Zealand economy. Are we paying too much attention to China? Is there a danger there? Uh, well, uh, I mean, it's now our largest single source of imports, the largest single export market. It's hard to deny that's a very important place for us. But is, is there a danger in it because China is China? Uh, well, there's a danger in the sense that being dependent on any market. I mean, we were dependent for years, as you know, on the UK market. Then the UK entered the European community, as it was then called, and we got disadvantaged. Coming back finally to, um, to local, local stuff, the future of the ACT Party uh, I've had a very high regard for Jamie White. I tried to recruit him as a National Party candidate in 2005. He was still, still living in London, not ready to come back to New Zealand. David Seymour was very good. Richard Preble is their campaign director, and he's, he's extremely astute in my view. But I think one of the real challenges is that most voters do not understand that by voting for David Seymour and Epsom, they're not denying national any members of parliament. The number of national MPs in parliament is determined by the party vote. They can give away Epsom and not lose a single member of parliament. This is a manipulation of the system, of course. No, it's, it's MMP. Uh, I don't disagree with yeah. that. But my question was the future of the, of the ACT Party. Uh, well, now, if, if, if it's dependent on National not running a, a, a candidate of, of some solidity in competition, then and, and that's, that's the only reason for its survival, then does it really have a future? Uh, well, I don't agree with that. In 2005, the National Party refused to have a cup of tea with Rodney Hyde, and I was the leader at the time, so I know. We actually wrote a letter to Epsom voters saying, vote Richard Worth. Despite that fact, Epsom voters voted overwhelmingly with their electorate vote for Rodney Hyde. So I think they understand the system. All right, better but, than but, even, but even so, does, does the party itself actually have a, a real future a serious future, if all it's got is one MP. Uh, well, I think it's going to have more than that next time. Uh, why? Because I think people are gradually realising that national needs a conscience on the right. And yet that, that conscience on the right, as you put it, is very, could very easily become a split vote between, between ACT, Conservative Party in particular. Yeah, they're quite different parties. The Conservative Party is, is as, as its name implies, yeah. very conservative on issues. The ACT Party is a classical liberal party. But therein lies the difference, because they're both, they're both to the right of national. of national. Yeah, but I mean, the Conservative Party, for example, is very uneasy about foreign investment. Uh, they're very uneasy about privatisation. Uh, it's much closer to Winston Peters, in fact, 
than than the, the Act Party. The rest of your life. <laughs> well, I'm enjoying orcharding, and uh, I'm doing some consulting. In fact, I'm off uh, overseas later this month on a consulting project on on GST. Funnily enough, is GST going to go up again? I don't know the answer to that question, but I don't think it will. I mean, I don't, th- I don't think this party in fact, will increase it. In fact, in the minute that I have left, the taxation system as it is, how much could it be improved? Uh, I personally think we should be reducing the corporate tax rate. The corporate tax rate has a big effect on investment. If we want to, ma- to, to a major extent, increase investment, we should be reducing the corporate tax rate. Mm, the, the answer from some quarters would be that's only feeding John Key's mates. Uh, well, that is what they would say. But the reality is, if you want more investment, you have to be have a competitive corporate tax rate. And right now, we do not have. I thank you. Thank you, sir. Twice in one day. It's a big hit. It's hadn't happened for a long time. And we'll see you tonight. Don Brash, book, Incredible Luck, and released today. It is 5 to 11, News Talk ZB.